Chapter 6. Hospital Visit. The Safe. Stantonville. Gold Greed. Mr. Bowditch Comes Home. 1. Mr. Bowditch and I had quite the chat while his roommate was in the third floor lounge watching the White Sox play the Tigers with a heart monitor strapped to his chest. He's got some sort of ticker problem they can't quite fix. Mr. Bowditch said. Thank Christ I don't have to worry about that. I've got enough problems. He showed me how he could walk to the bathroom, leaning on those arm sleeve crutches for all he was worth. It obviously hurt him, and when he came back from taking a leak, his forehead was wet with sweat. But I was encouraged. He might need the urinal with its long and somehow baleful neck for night calls, but it looked good for avoiding the bedpan. As long as he didn't fall in the middle of the night and break his leg all over again, that was. I could see the muscles in his scrawny arms trembling with every lunging step. He sat down on the bed with a sigh of relief. Can you help me with the... He gestured at the ironmongery encasing his leg. I lifted the leg with the fixator, and when it was stretched out, he sighed again and asked for a couple of pills from the Dixie cup on his night table. I gave them to him, poured some water from his pitcher, and down they went, his Adam's apple bobbing in his wrinkled neck like a monkey on a stick. They switched me from the morphine pump to this, he said. Oxycontin. The doctor says I'll get hooked, if I'm not already, and I'll have to kick the habit. Right now, that seems like a fair trade. Just walking to the bathroom feels like a fucking marathon. I could see that, and the bathroom at his house was further from the rollout. He might be needing the bedpan after all, at least to begin with. I went into the bathroom, wet down a washcloth, and wrung it out. When I bent over him, he pulled back. Here, here, what do you think you're doing? Getting the sweat off you. Hold still. We never know when the turning points come in our relationships with others, and it was only later that I realized that was one for us. He held back a moment longer, then relaxed a little, and allowed me to wipe his brow and cheeks. Feel like a fucking baby. You're paying me, let me earn my fucking money. That made him chuckle. A nurse peeked in the door and asked if he needed anything. He said he didn't, and when she was gone, he told me to close the door. This is where I ask you to stand up for me, he said. At least until I can stand up for myself. And Radar, too. You ready to do that, Charlie? I'll do my best. Yeah, maybe you will. It's all I can ask. I wouldn't put you in this position if I didn't have to. A woman named Ravensburger came to see me. Have you met her? I said I had. Hell of a name, isn't it? I try to think of a burger made out of raven meat, and my mind just boggles. I won't say he was stoned on the oxy, but I won't say he wasn't. As gaunt as he was, six feet tall and surely no more than 150, those pink pills had to pack a wallop. She talked to me about what she called my payment options. I asked her what the damage was so far, and she gave me a printout. It's in the drawer there, he pointed. But don't bother about that just now. I said, that's mighty high. And she said, good care is mighty expensive, Mr. Bowditch, and you have gotten the best. She said if I needed to consult a payment specialist, whatever that is when it's home and dry, she'd be happy to facilitate a meeting, either before I leave or after I'm home. I said I didn't think that would be necessary. I told her I could pay in full, but only if I got a discount. Then we got down to the dickering. We finally settled on 20% off which comes to about a $19,000 discount. I whistled. Mr. Bowditch grinned. 
I tried to get her down to 25%, but she wouldn't budge off 20. I think that's the industry standard. And hospitals are an industry, in case you wondered. Hospitals and prisons. Not much difference in how they run their businesses, except with prisons, it's the taxpayers who wind up footing the bill. He wiped a hand across his eyes. I could have paid the whole thing, but I enjoyed the dickering. Been a long time since I've had a chance to do any. Yard sales, in the old days. Bought a lot of books and old magazines. I like old things. Am I rambling? I am. Here's the point. I can pay, but I need you to make it possible. If you're thinking about what's in the flower canister, he waved that away as if $8,000 were petty cash. In terms of what he owed the hospital, it was. Here's what I want you to do. He told me. When he was done, he asked me if I needed to write it down. It's okay if you do, as long as you destroy your notes when the job's done. Maybe just the safe combination. I'll write it on my arm, then wash it off. You'll do it? Yes. I couldn't imagine not doing it, if only to find out if what he was telling me was real. Good. Repeat the steps back to me. I did, then used his bedside pen to write a series of numbers and turns on my upper arm, where the sleeve of my t-shirt would cover it. Thank you, he said. You'll have to wait until tomorrow to see Mr. Heinrich, but you can get ready tonight, when you feed radar. I said okay, said goodbye, and left. I was, my dad's word, gobsmacked. Halfway down the elevator, I thought of something and came back. Changed your mind already? He was smiling, but his eyes looked worried. No, I just wanted to ask you about something you said. What was it? Something about presents? You said a brave man helps, but a coward gives presents. I don't remember saying that. Well, you did. What does it mean? I don't know. It must have been the pills talking. He was lying. I lived with a drunk for several years, and I knew a lie when I heard it. Two. I biked back to 1 Sycamore Street, and it wouldn't be an overstatement to say I was wild with curiosity. I unlocked the back door and accepted an exuberant greeting from Radar. She was able to get up on her back paws for strokes, which made me think that the newer pills might be packing a punch. I let her out in the backyard to do some business. I kept sending her mental messages to hurry up and pick a spot. When she was back in, I went upstairs to Mr. Bowditch's bedroom and opened his closet. He had a lot of clothes, mostly slop around stuff like flannel shirts and khaki pants, but there were two suits. One was black, one was gray, and both of them looked like the kind of suits George Raft and Edward G. Robinson wore in movies like Each Dawn I Die double-breasted and wide in the shoulders. I pushed aside the clothes and revealed a watchman safe, medium-sized, old-fashioned, about three feet high. I squatted, and as I reached for the combination dial, something cold nuzzled my back where my shirt had pulled out of my pants. I yelped and turned to see Radar, her tail wagging slowly back and forth. The cold thing had been her nose. Don't do that, girl, I said. She sat down, grinning as if to say she'd do what she wanted. I turned back to the safe. I got the combo wrong the first time, but on my second try, the door swung open. The first thing I saw was a gun resting on the safe's single shelf. It was bigger than the one my dad gave my mom for those times when he had to be away for a few days, or once for a week on a company retreat. That one was a 32, a lady's gun for sure, and I thought he might still have it, but wasn't entirely sure. There were times when his drinking was at its worst. I'd gone looking for it, but I never found it. This one was bigger, probably a 45 revolver. Like most of Mr. Bowditch's stuff, it looked old school. 
I picked it up, gingerly, and found the catch that swung the cylinder. It was loaded, all six chambers. I swung the cylinder back into place and returned it to the shelf. Considering what he'd told me, a gun made sense. A burglar alarm might have made even more, but he didn't want any police calls at number one sycamore. Besides, in her earlier days, Radar had been a perfectly good burglar alarm, Andy Chen being a case in point. On the floor of the safe was what Mr. Bowditch had told me I'd find. A big steel bucket with a knapsack laid over the top. I picked up the knapsack and saw the bucket was filled almost to the top with those BBs that weren't BBs, but solid gold pellets. The bucket had a double handle. I grabbed it and lifted. From my squatting position, I could barely manage it. There had to be 40 pounds of gold in there, maybe 50. I sat down and turned to look at radar. Jesus Christ, this is a fucking fortune. She thumped her tail. Three. That night, after I fed her, I went upstairs and looked at the bucket of gold again, just to make sure I hadn't imagined it. When I got home, Dad asked me if I was ready for Mr. Bowditch's homecoming. I said I was, but I had stuff to do before he arrived. Still okay to borrow your drill and that power screwdriver? Of course. And I'd still be glad to come up and give you a hand if I could, but I've got a meeting at nine. It's that apartment house fire I told you about. Turns out it may have been arson. I'll be fine. Hope so. Are you okay? Sure. Why? Oh, you seem a little off. Worried about tomorrow? A little, I said, which wasn't a lie. You may wonder if I had any urge to tell my father about what I'd found. I didn't. Mr. Bowditch had sworn me to secrecy, that was one thing. He claimed the gold hadn't been stolen in the usual sense, and that was another. I'd asked what that meant, but all he would say is that nobody in the whole world was looking for it. Until I knew more, I was willing to take him at his word. There was another thing. I was 17 years old, and this was the most exciting thing that had ever happened to me by far, and I wanted to chase it. Four. On Monday morning, I biked up to Mr. Bowditch's house bright and early to feed radar, and she did the heavy looking on while I installed the safety bars. The toilet was already a cozy fit in the tiny bathroom, and the safety bars would make a descent to the unloading position even cozier, but I thought that was good. I foresaw a certain amount of grumbling, but it would be hard for him to fall. He could even hold on to the bars while he urinated, which I thought was a plus. I tried wiggling them, and they stayed solid. What do you think, Raids? Good to go? Radar thumped her tail. You can weigh the gold on my bathroom scale, Mr. Bowditch told me during our conversation. It won't be exact, but a kitchen scale takes forever. I know from experience. Use the knapsack to weigh and carry. Go a little on the heavy side. Heinrich will weigh it himself on a scale that's more accurate. Digital, you know. He broke it into syllables like that, making it sound both silly and pretentious. How do you get it to him when you need a cash infusion? Stantonville is seven miles away. I take a Uber. Heinrich pays. For a minute, I didn't understand, then I did. What are you grinning about, Charlie? Nothing. Do you do these exchanges at night? He nodded. Usually around ten, when most of the people in the neighborhood are tucked in for the night. Especially Mrs. Richland from across the street. That one's a nosy Parker. So you said. It bears repeating. I had gotten the same impression. 
I don't think mine's the only business Heinrich does at night, but he's agreed to close the shop tomorrow so you can come in the morning, between 9.30 and 10. I've never done an exchange of this size with him. I'm sure it'll be all right. He's never played anything but straight with me. But there's a gun in the safe, and if you want to take it for protection, that would be fine. I had no intention of taking it. I know guns make some people feel powerful, but I'm not one of those guys. Just touching it made me feel creepy. If you had told me I would be carrying it not too far in the future, I would have called you crazy. I found a scoop in the pantry and went upstairs. I had washed the numbers off my arm after putting them in a password-protected note on my phone, but I didn't even need to consult it. The safe opened on my first try. I took the knapsack off the bucket and just marveled at all that gold. Unable to resist the impulse, I plunged my hands in up to the wrists and let the gold pellets run through my fingers. I did it again, and a third time. There was something hypnotic about it. I shook my head as if to clear it and started scooping gold. The first time I weighed the knapsack, the scale registered a little over three pounds. I added more and got it up to five. The last time, the needle stopped at seven, and I decided that was good. If Mr. Heinrich's digital scale showed more than the agreed-upon six pounds, I could bring back the extra. I still had stuff to do at the house before Mr. Bowditch's arrival. I reminded myself to get a bell he could ring in the night if he needed something. Home care for dummies suggested an intercom or baby monitor, but I thought Mr. Bowditch might like something a little more old school. I had asked him how much six pounds of gold was worth, both wanting and not wanting to know the amount I'd be carrying on my back as I biked the seven miles, mostly rural, to Stantonville. He told me that the last time he checked with the gold price group in Texas, it was going for about $15,000 a pound. But he can have it for 14 a pound. That's the price we agreed on. It comes to 84000 but he'll give you a check for 74000 that will take care of my hospital bill, with a little left over for me and a nice profit for him. Nice was putting it mildly. I don't know when Mr. Bowditch last checked with the gold price group, but as of the end of April in 2013, he was way low. I had checked the price of gold on my laptop before going to bed on Sunday night, and it was selling at better than $1,200 an ounce, which came to about 20000 per pound. Six pounds would have gone for around $115,000 on the gold exchange in Zurich, which meant this Heinrich dude would be $40,000 to the good. And gold wasn't like hot diamonds, where the buyer would insist on discounting because of the risk. The pellets were unmarked, anonymous, and could easily be melted down into little ingots or made into jewelry. I'd thought about calling Mr. Bowditch in the hospital to tell him he was selling cheap, but didn't. For a very simple reason. I thought he wouldn't care. I could sort of understand that. Even with six pounds taken from Cap'n Kid's bucket of gold, there was plenty left. My job, although Mr. Bowditch never said it, was just to do the deal and not get ripped off. It was a hell of a responsibility and I was determined to live up to the trust he'd put in me. I buckled the straps on my knapsack, checked the floor between the closet safe and the bathroom scale for any gold pellets that had gotten away, and found none. I gave Radar a good stroking, for luck, and headed out carrying $115,000 in a beat-up old knapsack. My old friend Birdie Bird would have called it a lot of cheddar. Five. Stantonville's downtown was a single street of cheesy shops, a couple of bars, and the kind of diner that serves breakfast all day, along with a bottomless cup of bad coffee. A number of the shops were closed and boarded up, with signs saying they were for sale or lease. My dad said that once Stantonville was a thriving little community, 
a great place to shop for people who didn't want to go into Elgin, Naperville, Joliet, or all the way to Chicago. Then, in the 1970s, the Stantonville Mall opened. Not just a mall, either, but a super mall with a 12-screen cineplex, a kiddie amusement park, a climbing wall, a trampoline area called Flyers, an escape room, and guys wandering around dressed as talking animals. That glitter dome of commerce was to the north of Stantonville. It sucked most of the life out of the downtown area, and what the mall missed got sucked out by the Walmart and Sam's Club to the south on the turnpike exit. Being on my bicycle, I avoided the pike and took Route 74A, a two-lane running past farms and cornfields. There were smells of manure and growing things. It was a pleasant spring morning and would have been a pleasant ride if I hadn't been aware of the small fortune I was carrying on my back. I remember thinking about Jack, the boy who'd climbed the beanstalk. I was on Stantonville's main drag by 9.15, which was a little early, so I stopped in the diner, got a Coke, and sipped it sitting on a park bench in a dirty little plaza featuring a dry fountain filled with trash and a bird beshitted statue of someone I'd never heard of. I thought about that plaza and dry fountain later, in a place even more deserted than Stantonville. I can't swear that Christopher Pauly was there that morning. I can't swear he wasn't. Pauly was the kind of guy who could fade into the landscape until he was ready for you to see him. He could have been in the diner, chowing down on bacon and eggs. He could have been in the bus shelter, or pretending to study the guitars and boomboxes in the Stantonville Pawn and Loan. Or he could have been nowhere. All I can say is that I don't remember anyone in a retro White Sox hat, the kind with the red circle on the front. Maybe he wasn't wearing it, but I never saw that son of a bitch without it. At 20 to 10, I tossed my half-full go cup into a nearby trash barrel and pedaled slowly down Main Street. The business section, such as it was, ran only four blocks. Near the end of the fourth, just a stone's throw from a sign reading, thanks for visiting beautiful Stantonville, was Excellent Jewelers We Buy and Sell. It looked as shabby and dilapidated as the rest of this dying town's businesses. There was nothing in the dusty show window. The sign hanging in the door from a little plastic cup said, Closed. There was a bell. I pushed it. No response. I pushed it again very conscious of the pack on my back. I put my nose against the glass and cupped my hands to the sides of my face to cut the glare. I saw a shabby rug and empty display cases. I was starting to think either I'd made a mistake or Mr. Bowditch had when a little man in a tweed cap, button-up sweater, and baggy pants came limping up the center aisle. He looked like a gardener in a British detective show. He stared at me, then limped away and pressed a button by the old-fashioned cash register. The door buzzed. I pushed it open and stepped inside to a smell of dust and slow decay. Coming back, coming back, he said. I stayed where I was. You're Mr. Heinrich, right? Who else? Could I, um, see your driver's license? He frowned at me, then laughed. The old man sends a careful boy, and good for him. He took a beat-up wallet from his back pocket and flopped it open so I could see his driver's license. Before he flopped it closed again, I saw that his first name was Wilhelm. Satisfied? Yes, thank you. Coming back. Schnell. I followed him into the back room, which he unlocked with a keypad, carefully shielding it from me while he punched in the numbers. Inside was all the stuff that wasn't up front. Shelves crammed with watches, lockets, brooches, rings, pendants, chains. Rubies and emeralds flashed fire. I saw a tiara loaded with diamonds and pointed. Are those real? 
Yeah, yeah, real. But I don't think you came here to buy. You came here to sell. You may be noticed I didn't ask to see your driver's license. That's good, because I don't have one. I already know who you are. I saw your picture in the paper. The Sun? USA Today! You are nationwide young, Mr. Charles Reed. At least for this week. You saved old Bowditch's life. I didn't bother telling him it had been the dog. I was tired of that. I only wanted to do my business and get out. All the gold and jewels freak me out a little, especially when compared to the barren shelves out front. I almost wished I'd brought the gun, because I was starting to feel not like Jack the Beanstalk Boy, but Jim Hawkins in Treasure Island. Heinrich was small and dumpy and undangerous, but what if he had a Long John Silver associate lurking somewhere? It wasn't an entirely paranoid idea. I could tell myself that Mr. Bowditch had been doing business with Heinrich for years, but Mr. Bowditch himself had said he'd never done an exchange of this magnitude. Let's see what you have, he said. In a boy's adventure novel, he would have been a caricature of greed, rubbing his hands together and all but drooling, but he just sounded businesslike, maybe even a little bored. I didn't trust that, and I didn't trust him. I set the backpack on the counter. There was a scale nearby, and it was, indeed, digital. I unzipped the flap. I held it open, and when he peered in, I saw something change in his face. A tightening of the mouth and a momentary widening of the eyes. Mein Gott what you've been carrying on your bicycle. The scale had a lucite trough hanging on chains. Heinrich put small handfuls of gold pellets into the trough until the scale read two pounds. He set them aside in a plastic container, then weighed another two. When he finished weighing the last two and adding them to the rest, there was still a small creak of gold in one of the folds at the bottom of the backpack. Mr. Bowditch had told me to go a little heavy, and I had done so. I think another quarter pound left over, Hein, he said, peering in. You sell it to me. I give you three thousand dollars cash money. Bowditch doesn't need to know. Call it a gratuity. Call it something he could hold over my head, I thought. I said thanks anyway and zipped the flap closed. You have a check for me, right? Yes. The check was folded into the pocket of his old guy sweater. It was from the PNC Bank of Chicago, Belmont Avenue branch, and made out to Howard Bowditch in the amount of $74,000. The memo opposite Wilhelm Heinrich's signature read, Personal Services. It looked okay to me. I put it in my wallet and put the wallet in my left front pocket. He is a stubborn old man who refuses to move with the times, Heinrich said. Often, in the past, when we have dealt with much smaller amounts, I have given him cash. On two occasions, checks. I told him, have you not heard of electronic deposit? And do you know what he said? I shook my head, but I could guess. He said, I haven't heard of it, and I don't want to hear of it. And now, for the first time, he sends a Zwischengien, an emissary, because he has had an accident. I would have said he had no one in the world he could trust with such an errand, but here you are, a boy on a bicycle. And here I go, I said, and went to the door leading back to the as-yet-empty store, where he might or might not stock the display cases later. I half expected the door to be locked, but it wasn't. I felt better once I was back where I could see daylight. Even so, the smell of elderly dust was unpleasant, crypt-like. Does he even know what a computer is? Heinrich asked, following me and shutting the door to the back room behind him. I'm betting not. I had no plans to be drawn into a discussion of what Mr. Bowditch did or didn't know, and just said it was nice to meet him, which wasn't true. I was relieved to see that no one had stolen my bike, 
Leaving my house that morning, I'd been too preoccupied with other things to remember my bike lock. Heinrich took me by the elbow. I turned and now saw the inner Long John Silver after all. He only needed a parrot on his shoulder to make the picture complete. According to Silver, his parrot had seen as much wickedness as the devil himself. I guessed Wilhelm Heinrich had seen his share of wickedness. But you have to remember that I was 17 and waist-deep in matters I didn't understand. In other words, I was scared to death. How much gold does he have? Heinrich said in a low, guttural voice. His occasional use of German words and phrases had felt like an affectation to me, but just then, he really did sound German, and not a nice German. Tell me how much he has, and where he gets it. I'll make it worth your while. I'll be going now, I said, and did. Was Christopher Pauly watching as I mounted my bike and rode away with the remaining gold pellets in my backpack? I wouldn't know, because I was looking back over my shoulder at Heinrich's pale, pudgy face, suspended above the closed sign in his dusty shop door. Maybe it was imagination, probably it was, but I thought I could still see the greed on his face. Furthermore, I understood it. I remembered plunging my hands into that bucket and letting the pellets run through my fingers. Not just greed, but gold greed. Like in a pirate story. 6. Around 4 o'clock that afternoon, a van with Arcadia outpatient on the side pulled up to the curb. I was waiting on the walk with Radar on her leash. The gate, now rust-free and newly oiled, was standing open. An orderly got out of the van and opened the back doors. Melissa Wilcox was standing there behind Mr. Bowditch, who was in a wheelchair with his fixator-encased leg outstretched. She unlocked the wheelchair, pushed it forward, and hit a button with the heel of her hand. As the platform and wheelchair started to descend, my stomach also sank. I'd remembered the phone, the urinal, even the call bell. His check from Heinrich was safe in my wallet. All good, but there was no wheelchair ramp. Not in front and not in back. I felt like an idiot, but at least I didn't have to feel that way for long. I had radar to distract me. She saw Mr. Bowditch and launched herself at him. No sign of arthritis in her hips just then. I managed to snub the leash in time to keep her from getting her paws squashed by the descending lift, but I felt the shock go all the way up my arm. Yarp, yarp, yarp. These weren't the big dog roars that had so frightened Andy back in the day, but cries so plaintive and human that they wrung my heart. You're back, those yarks said. Thank God, I thought you were gone forever. Mr. Bowditch held out his arms to her, and she jumped up, paws on his outstretched leg. He winced, then laughed and cradled her head. Yes, girl, he crooned. It was hard for me to believe he could make a sound like that, even when I was hearing it, but he did. That grouchy old man crooned. There were tears in his eyes. Radar was making little sounds of happiness, her big old tail swishing back and forth. Yes, girl, yes, I missed you too. Now get down, you're killing me. Radar dropped back onto all fours and walked beside the wheelchair as Melissa rolled it up the walk, bumping and yawing. No ramp, I said. Sorry, sorry, I can build one. I'll look up how to do it on the net. Everything's on the net. I was babbling and couldn't seem to stop. I think everything else is more or less ready. We'll hire someone to put in a ramp, so quit fussing, Mr. Bowditch interrupted. You don't need to do everything. One of the perks of being an amanuensis is delegating tasks. And there's no hurry. I don't go out much, as you know. Did you take care of that business matter? Yes, this morning. Good. Melissa said, You two should be able to lift that chair up the steps, strong guys like you. What do you think, Herbie? No problem, the orderly said. Right, chum? I said, sure, and took one side. 
Radar scrambled halfway up the steps, paused once when her back legs betrayed her, then got it back in gear and made it up the rest of the way. She looked down at us, tail thumping. And someone should fix that path if he's going to use it, Melissa said. It's worse than the dirt road I grew up on back in Tennessee. Ready, Hoss? Herbie asked. We lifted the wheelchair up to the porch. I fumbled through Mr. Bowditch's keys and finally found the one that opened the front door. Hey, the orderly said. Didn't I see your picture in the paper? I sighed. Probably me and Radar out there by the gate. No, no. Last year. You scored the winning touchdown in the turkey bowl five seconds before the clock ran out. He raised one hand over his head, holding an invisible football, as I had done in the photo. Hard to tell why him remembering that picture instead of the more recent one made me happy, but it did. In the living room, I waited, more nervous than ever, while Melissa Wilcox inspected the rollout couch. Good, she said. This is good. A little low, maybe, but we make do with what we have. You'll want a bolster or something to give that leg of his a little extra support. Who made the bed up? I did, I said, and her look of surprise also made me happy. Did you read the pamphlet I gave you? Yes. I got this antibacterial stuff for pin care. She shook her head. Simple saline is all you need. Warm salt water. Do you feel ready to transfer him? Hello, Mr. Bowditch said. Perhaps I could be a part of this conversation. I'm right here. Yes, but I'm not talking to you. Melissa said it with a smile. I'm not sure, I said. Mr. Bowditch, Melissa said, now I am talking to you. Do you mind if Charlie test drives you? Mr. Bowditch looked at Radar, who was sitting as close as she could. What do you think, girl? Trust this kid? Radar barked once. Radar says okay, and I say okay. Don't drop me, young man. This leg is singing high C. I moved the chair close to the bed, put on the brake, and asked him if he could stand on his good leg. He pushed himself up partway, allowing me to unlock and lower the leg rest that had been supporting his bad one. He grunted, but made it the rest of the way, swaying a little, but vertical. Turn so your butt's facing the bed, but don't try to sit until I tell you, I said, and Melissa nodded approvingly. Mr. Bowditch did that. I moved the wheelchair out of the way. Can't stand this way for long without the crutches. The sweat was popping on his cheeks and brow again. I squatted and took hold of the fixator. Now you can sit. He didn't sit, he dropped, and with a sigh of relief. He lay back, I put his bad leg on the bed, and my first transfer was complete. I wasn't sweating as much as Mr. Bowditch was, but I was sweating, mostly from nerves. This was a bigger deal than taking throws from the pitcher. Not bad, Melissa said. When you get him up, you'll want to hug him. Lace your fingers together in the middle of his back and lift. Use his armpits for support, I said. It was in the pamphlet. I like a boy who does his homework. Make sure his crutches are always close, especially when standing from the bed. How do you feel, Mr. Bowditch? Like ten pounds of shit in a nine-pound bag. Is it time for my pills? You had them before we left the hospital. You can have more at six. That seems like a long time from now. How about a Percocet to tide me over? How about I don't have any? Then to me. You'll get better at this, and so will he, especially as he mends and his range of movement increases. Step outside with me a moment, will you? Talking behind my back, Bowditch called. Whatever it's about, that young man will not be administering any enemas. Whoa, Herbie said. He was bent over, hands on his knees, examining the television. This is the oldest idiot box I've ever seen, partner. Does it work? 7. The late day sun was brilliant, and there was some warmth to it which felt wonderful after a long winter and a cold spring. 
Melissa led me down to the outpatient van, leaned in and unlocked the wide center console. She brought out a plastic bag and set it on the seat. Crutches are in back. Here's his drugs, plus two tubes of Arnica gel. There's a sheet in here with the exact dosages, okay? She took the bottles out and showed them to me one by one. These are antibiotics. These are vitamins, four different kinds. This one's a prescription for Linparza. Get refills at the CVS in Century Village. These are laxatives. There are no suppositories, but you should read up on how to administer them if he needs one. He won't like it. Not much he does like, I said. Mostly radar. And you, she said. He likes you, Charlie. He says you're trustworthy. I hope he's not just saying that because you came along at the right time to save his life. Because there's these. The biggest bottle was filled with 20 milligram Oxycontin pills. Melissa looked at me solemnly. This is a bad drug, Charlie. Very addictive. It's also extremely effective against the kind of pain your friend is now suffering and may continue suffering for eight months to a year. Perhaps longer, depending on his other issues. What other issues? She shook her head. Not for me to say. You just stick to the dosing schedule and turn a deaf ear to his demands for more. He can actually get more before our therapy sessions, and knowing that will become one of his primary motivations, maybe his biggest, to continue with the therapy even when it hurts. And it will hurt. You need to keep them where he can't get at them. Can you think of a place? Yes. It was the safe I was thinking of. It'll work, at least until he can climb the stairs. So, three weeks, if he sticks with his therapy, maybe a month. Once he can go up, you'll need to think of another one. And it isn't just him you have to worry about. To the addicted, these pills are worth their weight in gold. I laughed. I couldn't help it. What? What's so funny? Nothing. I'll keep them safe, and I won't let him talk me into more. She was looking at me closely. What about you, Charlie? Because I have no business giving these to a minor. So far as the doctor who prescribed them knows, they'll be administered by an adult caregiver. I could get in trouble. Would you be tempted to try one or two and get a little bit high? I thought of my father and what the booze had done to him and how I had once believed we might be sleeping under highway bridges, all our possessions in a stolen shopping cart. I took the big bottle of oxy tablets and dropped it back into the bag with the rest of the medicines. Then I took her by the hand and looked into her eyes. Not fucking likely, I said. Eight. There was a little more instruction, which I drew out because I was nervous to be alone with him. What if something happened and that stupid 1970s phone decided not to work? Then you'll call 911 on your 21st century phone, I thought. Like you did when you found him on the back steps. But if he had a heart attack? What I knew about CPR I'd learned on TV shows. And if his motor stopped, there wouldn't be time to check out a YouTube video on the subject. I saw more homework in my future. I watched them drive away and went back inside. Mr. Bowditch was lying with one arm over his eyes. Radar sat attentively by the bed. Now it was just the three of us. You okay? I asked. He dropped his arm and turned his head to look at me. His expression was desolate. I'm in a deep hole, Charlie. I don't know if I can climb out. You will, I said, hoping I sounded more confident than I felt on that subject. Want something to eat? I want my pain pills. I can't... He raised a hand. I know you can't, and I won't lower myself or insult you by begging for them, ever. At least, I hope not. He stroked Radar's head again and again. She sat perfectly still, her tail moving slowly from side to side, her eyes never leaving him. Give me the check and a pen. I did that along with a hardcover book he could use for support. He printed four deposit only, then scrawled his signature. Will you bank that for me tomorrow? Sure. First citizens, right? Right. 
Once it's in the system, I can write a check to cover my hospital stay. He handed me the check, which I put back in my wallet. He closed his eyes, opened them again, and stared at the ceiling. His hand never left Radar's head. I'm so tired. And the pain never takes a vacation, doesn't even take a fucking coffee break. Food? Don't want it, but they tell me I have to eat. Maybe some SNS. Sardines and saltines. That sounded terrible to me, but I got them along with a glass of ice water. He drank half of that greedily. Before starting on the sardines, headless and gleaming with grease. Ugh. He asked me if I still meant to stay the night. Tonight and all week, I said. Good. I never minded being alone before. But now it's different. Do you know what falling off that ladder taught me? Or rather, re-taught me? I shook my head. Fear. I'm an old man, and I'm broken. He said this without self-pity, but as a man states a fact. I think you should go home long enough to reassure your father that all is well so far, don't you? Perhaps have a bite of supper? And you can come back and feed Radar and give me my goddamn pills. They said I would become addicted, and it hasn't taken long to prove them right. That sounds like a plan. I paused. Mr. Bowditch, Howard, I'd like to bring my dad up to meet you. I know you're not exactly a people person, even when you aren't busted up, but... I understand. He wants to reassure himself, which is perfectly reasonable. But not tonight, Charlie. And not tomorrow. Wednesday, perhaps. By then, I might feel a little better. Okay, I said. One more thing. I wrote my cell number on a post-it and put it on the little table beside his bed, a table that would soon be covered with rubs and gauze pads and pills, but not the oxy. The bell is for when I'm upstairs. Very Victorian. But any time I'm gone and you need me, call me on my cell, whether I'm in school or not. I'll tell Mrs. Silvius in the office what the situation is. All right. Go on. Reassure your father. But don't be late coming back, or I'll try to get up and find those pills myself. He closed his eyes. Bad idea, I said. Without opening them, he said, The universe is full of them. Nine. Mondays are catch-up days for my father. Often he's not home until 6.30 or 7, so I didn't expect to find him there, and he wasn't. He was outside Mr. Bowditch's front gate, waiting for me. I left work early, he said when I came out. Worried about you. You didn't have to. He slung an arm around my shoulders and gave me a hug. So sue me. I saw you come out and talk to a young woman while I was halfway up the hill. I waved, but you didn't see me. You looked like you were concentrating hard on whatever she was telling you. And you've been waiting out here since then? I thought about knocking on the door, but I guess in this situation I'm like a vampire. I can't come in until I'm invited. Wednesday, I said. I talked to him about it. Sounds good. In the evening? Maybe around seven, he gets his pain pills at six. We started walking down the hill. His arm was still around my shoulders. I didn't mind. I told him I didn't want to leave Mr. Bowditch alone for long, so I couldn't stay for supper. I said I'd put together a few things, my toothbrush came to mind, and find something to eat in his pantry. Just not sardines. You don't need to do that, Dad said. I brought subs from Jersey Mike's. Take it back with you. Great. How is he? In a lot of pain. I hope the pills he takes will help him sleep. He gets more at midnight. Oxys? Yes. Keep them safe. Don't let him know where they are. This was advice I'd already had, but at least Dad didn't ask if I might be tempted to try one myself. At home, I stuffed a couple of days' worth of clothes in my backpack, along with my Nighthawk portable hotspot. My phone was good, but the Nighthawk provided kick-ass Wi-Fi. 
I added my toothbrush and the razor I'd started using two years before. Some guys at school were sporting stubble that year. It was a thing. But I like a clean face. I did it fast, knowing I could come back tomorrow for anything I forgot. I was also thinking of Mr. Bowditch, alone in his big old leaky house with only his elderly dog for company. When I was ready to go, my father gave me another hug, then held me by the shoulders. Look at you, taking on a serious responsibility. I'm proud of you, Charlie. I wish your mother could see you. She'd be proud too. I'm kind of scared. He nodded. I'd be worried if you weren't. Just remember that if anything happens, you can call me. I will. You know, I was looking forward to you going to college. Now, not so much. This house is going to feel empty without you. I'm just a quarter mile up the street, Dad. But there was a lump in my throat. I know, I know. Go on and get out of here, Chip. Do your job. He swallowed. Something clicked in his throat. And do it well. Thank you.